Welcome everyone. We're pleased you could all be here tonight. Welcome to this online program of the American Writers Museum. My name is Allison Sansoni and I'm the program director here at the museum. Just a few short housekeeping things before we begin. Um, as you're watching this conversation, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're monitoring that for questions at the end of this. And while we might not have time to get to everyone's questions, we'll try to ask as many as we can. We apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to yours. If you like the kinds of online programs you've been seeing from us in the past several months, you can become a member and get advance notice of special programs and offers, including our upcoming exhibit, Indistinguish Inextinguishable, about Ray Bradbury. Our YouTube channel has videos posted of programs from the past three years, so you can check that as well for news and updates. Our book selling partner um, and this event's co-sponsor is Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and you can order tonight's book online from them from a link we'll post in the chat once we begin. All the orders placed during the event tonight will get a special signed book plate from our author. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here this evening to talk with one of this country's most beloved tellers of tales on the publication day of his new book. Gary Paulson is a three-time Newbery Honor Award winner and author of some of America's best loved works for young people, including the Hatchet series. Tonight, he's presenting his own story in memoir with Gone to the Woods. Kirkus Reviews called Gone to the Woods rich and compelling, both brightly funny and darkly tragic. It is fresh in its honest portrayal of difficult themes. He's being interviewed tonight by Betsy Bird, who's a children's book author, podcast host, blogger, and librarian. She's the author or editor of six books, including Funny Girl, Funniest Stories Ever, The Great Santa Stakeout, and Wild Things, Acts of Mischief in Children's Literature. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It's really good to be here. Really it's good. Really nice to have you. Yeah. Have you been Have you been doing the virtual rounds uh, with your latest book? Virtually, I've I've just been watching reviews, which is which is fun. And uh, in my case, um, I, I uh, not yet, not so much yet. Some, some they're they're going around, but but uh, mostly I'm just. Dazzled, I think is the word. Well, where are you right now? I'm in the mountains in New Mexico. In fact, this is the situation. If the power goes off, cell phones don't work here. And I have to jump in my truck and drive 18, well, 18 and a half miles out into the flats of the desert. And the cell phone will work there. And I can call somebody back and say the power is off and my phone and computers are dead. So if I suddenly disappear, that's what happened. Okay. Although it's kind of holding now, it's, it's doing better. Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm in the mountains, high mountains of, of New Mexico, surrounded by peaks, alone. I don't and, even have my dog up here now. Well, and what's the temperature supposed to reach there? Well, it's supposed to get down to eight tonight, which is not something I'm happy with, but I used to love it too. Mm -hmm. I loved cold. I used to run in blizzards with the dogs. Oh, well. Oh, sorry. A different well, life. <laughs> And speaking of lives, you like that? Like that segue? That was, that was good. That was really good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good about it. And then I ruined it by pointing it out. So there you go. No. Um, you know, it's in some ways, it's to be unfortunate in your childhood is to be fortunate in the content of your memoir um, that you, you write someday. I, there are many memoirs written by children's authors for kids about themselves. Um, and very, very few hold a candle to what you have lived yourself. Why are you writing this book now? And how long have you been writing it? I've written about parts of my childhood and parts of my life earlier, not in third person, but first person. Uh, in this case, it's, they're, they're pivotal points I'm gesturing. Can that be shown? I, I don't. Anyway, there are pivotal points that have affected my life. Uh, one of them was the first section of the book. Then there's that brief bit taking the ship to the Philippines, and then the army, of course, uh, and and uh, my teenage years, uh, 13. All those are, are critical points in in my life, 
and I wanted to write about them as a flow showing all those things. Now, the reason it's third person, through first person biographies, you tend to want to change it and say it was a bigger fish or it really wasn't that bad or it's worse or something. And I thought by, by getting detached a little bit, I could have more clarity and it worked. I, I actually was surprised sometimes at how well it worked. I kept thinking, I hope the little bugger makes it. And, and about myself, <laughs> I really did. I, I would remember things that were just horrific and uh, uh, things I would not want to see now even as an adult, but, but uh, I was astonished that I got through them. I really was. At the, at the time, they just were part of my life, you know, and I went on. That was, I was going to ask that. At the time, did you realize how horrific? Because the book begins, I should say, you're five um, and your mom is putting you on a train that alone to go visit, not visit, to stay with relatives you've never met before. And you're on the same train as soldiers coming back from the war who are not well. They've been um, hit. They've been blown apart and stuff. Uh, my father was in Europe at that time fighting with, with the Germans, against the Germans with Patton. He was on Patton's staff, a low level staff officer. I didn't meet him till I was seven, <clears throat> excuse me. But I, uh, I just was immersed in a kind of an immense curiosity about everything. And I, I would sometimes ask them, I didn't do this a lot in the book, but if they'd known my father, did they see my father? Had because I had not seen him, and I'd seen one picture of him, a phony pho uh, photograph that had been tinted. That's all I saw of him. I, I didn't think of it as strange then. Sometimes I was afraid. There was fear, but but uh, in the Philippines, I saw men killed by machine guns. And and uh, what's bizarre is that I was seven, eight years old when I saw that. 10 years exactly later, I was being taught by the army how to use machine guns, mm -hmm. the same guns. And um, it, it, it makes that complete then, makes it whole. Sometime later from, from that, I was fighting in a sense in aerospace. I was a, a field engineer in electronics and satellite tracking and stuff. We were putting satellites over Russia and we were at war. Nobody knew it, but we were. We, we worked constantly for 12 hours a day for months and months and months uh, because of that. And I realized how stupid war was. So that's the same thing that started with the machine guns and all the way to where I finally figured out war sucked. It was just awful and uh, it can't be justified. Well, let's back it up a little bit because there's a lot of people who just don't know what the book covers. So this is your story written in, as you said, in the third person, what, like what span of your life does it cover? Cause sometimes when people write memoirs, it's just a little chunk of their life in the middle of a larger hole. Sometimes they go from birth to right now. What are you covering in this book? It pretty much goes from birth to, to now or close to now. Mm -hmm. um, starting at about five when I was put on the train, you forgot to mention, I thought maybe I left it out. Then my mother put a $5 bill in my pocket too for the trip. <laughs> I can't believe I, I made that. Any, anyway, uh, uh, and then on a farm with my aunt and uncle um, who were you just started wonderful. In Chicago. So you were going from Chicago. I went from Chicago to, I did not know where I was in Chicago is one of your questions. Oh, um, I was, I was going to ask, like where in Chicago? I don't, I don't, I, my mother worked in a munitions plant. I thought there was an elevated railway nearby, but I don't know that there was elevated. I just thought it was. Okay. No, yeah. uh, but it was some kind of awful one room thing that we lived in. It wasn't very nice. Uh, and bars, we lived in bars too. Uh, spent a lot of time in bars. I just recently found a picture. I had nobody seen it but me right now, but of myself in my army uniform when I was four years old, three and four years old. And she'd have me sing in bars, uh, stand up in bars. And, and the rank in the in the little picture is sergeant. And when I was in the army, I made sergeant, which is a hoot. I didn't deserve it. And I don't know why they made me a sergeant, but. Uh, there seems to be a, a circular literary hole. Here. Apparently, <laughs> apparently. Some of it, I was talking about 
this to somebody else recently, but I, I've had a life of extremes. My first dog sled race was the Iditarod, 1,200 miles across Alaska alone with a dog team. My first Harley I bought in Mexico, El Paso, Texas, and took it up to Fairbanks, Alaska and back just to check it out. I mean, it's insane. Uh, first sailboat I sailed to Fiji. I decided that the word that would qualify for all those is oops. <laughs> God, I got wrecked. I broke both legs. I broke my arms. I mean, I was a mess. I had a moose kick teeth out back here. I still don't have teeth back here. They kick hard. They kick really hard. I, and, uh, oh. I was so mad at her. It was a little cow. She's about 400 pounds. Bulls get 1,600. I mean, it's this thing of little. Do you have a baby? Why were she kicking your teeth then? No, they're just mean. Oh, okay. Just Alaska. They had one chase me in the house once into the porch, oh, yeah. trying to get, trying to get me. I don't know. Maybe it's I'm anti moose or something. I don't know. And she she stayed with me close, so she chew and Will was watching me. If I move, she started kicking me again. <laughs> the dog teams had gone another hundred yards and got tangled. Uh -huh. I I didn't have a weapon or anything, so mm. off she went later. If I could have found her. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> and now this, is, this is the problem with talking with you because I'm like, I've got all these questions I should be asking you. And now all I'm I want sorry. to talk about, I'm about sorry. moose. No, I was just like, we're in very big danger of this turning into an entirely moose based discussion. So I'm, I'm gonna, sorry. I'm going to re extricate myself, okay. even though this is freaking fascinating. Okay. Yeah. But um, no, it's funny. Well, it's, it's funny. I was preparing these questions earlier today and. Uh, at the same time, I was, I was doing my job. I'm a librarian and I, I buy books and I was, um, I read the reviews uh, as I was doing. I was reading this Kirkus review of a memoir and the reviewer, you know, they're anonymous. So, you know, hat tip to you, anonymous reviewer. They wrote this about the book they were talking about, but I kept thinking about your book. They said that when it comes to memoirs, quote, the most indelible qualities of the genre an ability to inhabit a version of oneself that no longer exists, an instinct for what's important and what isn't, and a voice that implies personal growth gained through missteps and ultimately self-knowledge. And I wondered if you agreed with this. I mean, does does this book- I, I don't, I, I don't agree. I Some of it, what, again, the machine gun, eight years old, I saw it work. How awful they are. 10 years later, I was being taught how to use them. And I was good with them. Out to 1,500 yards, I could hit a man-sized silhouette every time, a mile away. Um, uh, again, later, the same person decides that war sucks and is awful. Now, that doesn't go away. It just is encompassed. I'm still the kid. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't become another thing when I, as I, as I gained longevity, I, I was going to not say grow, but I never really grew. Uh, I, I stayed as that child all the way along, being exposed to different things, uh, but they're still there. I'm still the same person. I didn't lose my identity at all. It became more full and sometimes confusing, of course, but, but uh you see things later that jerk you back to some points in that time. I worked in Colorado for a while as a voluntary ambulance driver, and I got every traffic wreck and every heart attack. And I mean, I was always alone because I was home all the time writing. So I just answered, I'd go and get the, the, the wagon and go, you know. And I never written about that stuff. And I'm, I'm not going to, but, uh, I would, it would jump my mind back to things that had happened in the Philippines or things that had happened at that way, you know. So it's, it's still there. It's still all there. It grows. Um, and I'm not quite done with it. <laughs> well, that's my question. I mean, yeah. Are, is there any chance of a sequel? I mean, I don't, I don't know if sequel would be the word. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, good it's point. the next <laughs> companion novel. I'm going, I'm going to write, uh, well, the ne the next book th that's going to be published is already written is with them now, the Northwind. Well, the next book is is uh, how to train your dad. Mm -hmm. 
or boyhood. Okay, and that's a comedy, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's a hoot. I had fun. I laughed when I was writing it. It's this maybe I should. Do you want me to talk about it at all? Yeah. What's the plot? What's the plot? Okay. The this boy has a perfect father, except that he's off the grid. He just lives in garage sales and dumpsters and stuff. And but he loves his father, but he's got to change. He's got sometimes mismatched tennis shoes or wearing bibs that say "juicy" across the butt that belong to a girl, that kind of thing. And and he wants to to get normal clothes and be a normal person, but they don't have money. And so he decides he's dumping dog food out of a sack into a can and a pamphlet falls out of the garden, the dog food sack. And it's a, how to train your puppy using positive reinforcement. And um, so he says, his friend tells me, you gotta reboot your dad. You just gotta change him. So they go through this whole thing. The, the book is him rebooting his father using puppy training as, as a way to do it. And it, there are other characters in the book, a biker and, and um, a pit bull that they own named Carol who is uh, all, do all, do all dogs look at your right eye for your emotions, all dogs, no wolves, no fox, no other canine does. But all dogs will study a person's right eye and can tell what they're thinking and, and what they're gonna do. And you see, even puppies, you put a puppy down that right eye is locked on. So this pit bull would study the boy's right eye all the time. <laughs> and then he, she loved garage sales and she'd keep him from going to garage sales. I had a blast writing this thing. Anyway, it's, it's uh, the next book out. And then after that is, is North Wind, which is a, it's, it's kind of a survival story. It's really not like Hatch at all, but the sea, it's about the sea and, and uh, Norwegian Norsky stuff. <laughs> Norwegians are very in right now. Um, do yeah. you consciously shift tone when you write? You're like, you, you write this. I have to assume it was an emotional thing to write. Yep. And then you write a comedy right after that. And then you yeah. go into something a little more serious after that. Do you do that consciously or do is that just how it naturally comes out for you? The stories to me are, I, I think the original story was somebody put bloody skins on his back and danced around the fire and said what the hunt was like. He told the story of that. Later that became words. Later it became writing. Later it became art. But the story is the same. The story is sacrosanct, I think. Now, whatever you need to tell that story, the, the way it can be told best is fair. Is fair. So I, I studied rhythms and pacing and I use that in some books, some in this. Um, I studied changes in character. There's an enormous difference between the writer Shakespeare and Harry Potter. They're both good. They're potentially good. I'm not saying either one is bad or good, but, but they're both human. They're both using words to do the, essentially the same thing, tell the story. And so I, that's what I do. If it's a if it's a, a comedy book, I, I don't have machine guns. <laughs> you know, if it if it's Good. exactly exactly. Uh, I'm for that choice. Yeah. <laughs> the third book, the Northwind book, has whales, mm. and they're, they're all things that happened to me. I I sailed a boat from Ventura, California, up the west coast. I'm gesturing here, but up the west coast, completely went in at Juan de Fuca, went all the way up the inside to Alaska, and came down the outside. And uh, you need time, right? I'm sorry. Uh, and that's, no. what, that's the, the, the book is about a person doing that same thing. Yeah. So, uh, and it's told in a more serious vein, including some runes, uh, Scandinavian runes and, and uh, carvings. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving vague here, but I, I think I better be because we haven't, the book is done, but it needs to be gone over and edited and stuff with Mel or with Wes. It's not Mel. His name is Wes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he's new, right? You have a you have a new editor, right? Wes, Wes, Wes Adams. How did how did you find him? She, my agent found him. She she knew about him and then put us together. Uh, before all this happened, we just got on the phone. I have a phone over here, and uh, I sat and talked to him for a long time. We talked together, 
before the, the contract or before anything like that. Um, the editor that I had at another place, David Gale had passed away. And uh, it was, I love Dale and it was heartbreaking. And uh, uh, West kind of fit in. And a, a woman that I know was, uh, who was interviewing me said, you're gonna love Wes. And I thought, well, I've been around a while and blah, blah, you know, kind of a smart, smart Alex, smart Alex, smart Alex. Sorry. Uh, she's dead right. He brings a kind of song to books now that that is coming back as, as part of writing. I just love it. I really, I'm having an incredibly good time with it. I really am. Are you going to do more books with him? I'm just going to write till I die. Mm -hmm. Probably about Thursday at four o'clock, but but I'm hoping for a little longer than that. But we'll see. Yeah, I'm going to work. I'm you've, going got to, a, you've got enough content from if you're even if you just like pulled from your life, you've got enough content to just go forever. You just, I mean, yeah. what you're telling me about isn't even in your books. It's just no, it isn't. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, you can write about a gate. You can write about a single thing and do a whole book. So when you start these uh, uh, stories, it might be about one little thing, one one sentence that a person says or an action they do or or uh, or believe. Um, Hemingway was writing about uh, Immovable Feast. I, I'm not telling Hemingway he's a jerk. Uh, I wouldn't like him probably personally. Yeah, shooting animals, come on. And the bull thing is stupid. But anyway, uh, he's writing about F. Scott Fitzgerald's talent. And he said it was like a butter, the dust on a butterfly's wing. And when it was gone, he didn't know, and he kept beating his wings. And I thought, how does he even think that? How, how does his brain do that, Hemingway? How, I mean, it just doesn't seem like it could come from him. And it did. And so... I've read Moby Dick, I think, four times. And it was a bust. He didn't make any money on it. He starved. Well, he died in poverty. Nobody wanted the book. It's a giant book. It's probably the greatest American novel ever done. It's just astonishing. And it starts with three words. Call me Ishmael. My God. I mean, seriously. They were, they were taking whole pages to describe part of a dress. You know, a hem on a dress might take five pages with, with Jane Austen or something, but here's this guy, call me Ishmael, and bow, just gone, the rhythms. Perfect. Well, and you started out writing for adults. Um, I, I did. I wrote Westerns and Mysteries. I had to learn. Uh, I'm going to back up a little. The, I know you asked about the librarian. The librarian to me. There's one in the book, yeah. Yeah is that's life and death seriously without what she did for me i would be well, explain, dead explain what she did for you tell well I, I was a poor reader and i flunked everything i was flunking in school i just didn't go uh teachers tried but it was a nightmare and just my home life was some god-awful thing that just terrible drunken screaming fits you know and stuff my parents were awful and uh, the library became a sanctuary. This is warm. It was in a small town in the north and cold in the winter. And I'd go in there to get warm and get away from the bullies. Uh, and she saw me there one day and asked me if I wanted a book. And I was, being, I was a smart ass. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll take one. And I don't remember what it was. She gave me a book and I, I felt honor bound to read it. And I was a poor reader. I took it home and I staggered through the thing. I just, I'd have to read page two over and over and then page three and then page like that. And I, and I, I don't remember a thing about the book except I got all the way through it and I took it back. And she gave me another book and then another book and then a book a week and two books a week. And then she'd throw in a Dickens or a Melville. And I would be in prison or dead without that. I, it was that critical. The school didn't work. <laughs> The, the state stepped in, as they do, because I just didn't go to school. And uh, they said, so that I would not be a burden in society. That's a quote. Uh, I should either take a, a vocational course for auto repair or television repair, television repair. 
Well, I'd been goofing around with ham radio with a friend of mine, so I just kind of knew about electronics. So I did have television repair. God, I wish I'd done car repair. Exactly. I don't know anything about cars. And you can't fix TVs now anyway, so it's just a wasted career, you know. But because of that, the tests I took in the Army had me as a, con a technical genius, and I went to every class. Here's one for you. A kid from a troubled family, 18 years old, is taught how to arm and use a nuclear weapon. I mean, I was good at it. I could do that. I, I could arm and, and use a nuclear weapon and take out a, a city, a whole city, if I had a bad day. Jeez. I mean, Matt, that was not the army where you can be all you can be type thing. It was, it was a different army. And I got $78 a month, which is big money. Are we tr in trouble? No. No, we're not. Talking. I'm sorry. I get so wrapped up in listening to you talk that I forget I'm supposed to do talking as well. And so I just enjoy listening to you so much. But as it happens, we are uh, we are actually at the point, almost at the point where I would be uh, taking questions from the audience. But not yet. Not yet. Because, not yet. oh, what's this? I got a tie can to here. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that that librarian handed you. It was a bright yeah. yellow pencil and she sharpened bright, it. Which this is not a sharp, but yes. And yes, and. She and what did she tell you to do with that Ticonderoga? I should, I should write down my thought pictures. I I told her about things in the woods. Because I was either in the woods or the library. Right. Or the streets between. I also set pins in a bowling alley. Uh, which is like a firefight. Uh, very dangerous. And uh, I, I started telling her about things in the woods that I would see. Like deer and stuff like that. And she asked me once. She said, you should write those down. I said, for who? And she said, me. Nobody gave me anything. Nobody. Parents, nobody. And she gave me a library card. Spelled my name right. Little embossed thing. And I is my identity, is what I became and what God. You just have no idea. You really don't. I it wasn't just pivotal, it was everything. I started to read then. David Gale and I were on a tour in Portland. I was giving a talk to I don't know, three, four hundred people. And I had done a book about Nam favoring soldiers because they were being spit on and stuff. And I'd done a one-shot magazine about it. And this guy came in the back and sometimes things would get physical sometimes. And uh, if you did it, you did it. You did what you had to do. So this guy comes in the back of the thing and I saw Levi's in a t-shirt and he hands an envelope and he hands it to David and walks out. And I thought, well, that's okay. Later, we're in the hotel lobby waiting for a car to take us to the airport, you know, the big circular fountain thing. And he says, oh, this man handed me this for you. And it was a, a, a letter. Well, this guy had been illiterate. And he'd read Hatchet. That was the first book he ever read. He's about 30. And he wrote two letters. One to his son, telling him that he could read, and one to me. Yeah. I could think of the library when that happened. David and I are bawling, just tears rolling down, hugging each other. <laughs> God knows what people thought going by, they'd stare at us, you know. <laughs> we we're both crying, just tears going down. And... Uh, that came from the library. That came from the librarian all the way back. The, the, the blue scripto pad, little pad, blue scripto, scripto, and a yellow pencil. Ticonderoga, number two. Ta-da. Right there, right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some of these people who are asking you 
questions over here. There, there's too many. We're not, we're not going to be able to go through them all, folks. I'm sorry. You have good questions, so I'm going to get as many as I can in the okay. next 15 minutes here. But uh, let's see. First, we've got one from Julie, and she says, "I really enjoyed this book. My book right here, and had also read your adult level biography. How'd you decide what to include for a young people's biography?" I don't. Uh... I don't change that. It's, it's, I think if you if you change it too much, you're not being honest. So there are things I left out, some physical things, but that's all. I, I left the machine guns in. I mean, things like that. I'm not. If it's if it's that terrible or that blunt or that beautiful, or that incredible, I leave it in. I don't write down. I never have. It's the best I can do. <laughs> well it is it's not Shakespeare but I got good bloody skins in my back dancer on the fire mm -hmm. let me give you another question here what are some of your favorite wild spaces in Minnesota New Mexico or elsewhere Minnesota it's the north woods of course I ran dogs all over that country, trapped up there for a long time. Uh, and then Alaska, oh my God, Alaska is just, it's a wonderful place, it really is. In fact, I miss it. But it's hard to deal with when you're in your 80s. You know, it's dark a lot and I can't run dogs anymore, I keep busted up. I tried about 10 years ago and, uh, oops, oops. That was a, a major oops. <laughs> your oopses sound painful. Oh. <laughs> Here's, a, here's an interesting one here. And I think it ties in nicely with your book. Um, someone asks, and they, they don't have a name. You seem to reflect a great appreciation and respect for nature in most of your young adult books. When and how did that develop? When I was young, I hunted a lot. And I, I don't hunt at all now. I trap too, but I, I did mostly to try and earn enough money to live and, and eat food. Uh, most animals are made out of meat and you can eat them. And I did. A lot of rabbits, deer, grouse, a lot of grouse in the woods. Uh, once I started to feel like part of that, I started to feel like, like there was no dividing line between nature and me. That started when I was very young on the train ride, actually. But it's also became more a stronger feeling later uh, a lot more evident later and i think we are all nature natural people just when you run dogs along when you run a thousand miles of the dog team you understand a primitive exaltation you go back thirty thousand years you and the dogs it's incredible and you're never normal again i know a doctor gave up his practice he's up there working for minimum wage running dogs loading dog food sacks into trucks he had a huge practice in, in the lower 48. It's, it takes everybody. You know. And nature does that, I think. Got one here from Andy, age eight. He says, which book you wrote is your favorite? I'm reading Hatchet and I love it. <laughs> well, it would be, have to be Hatchet for sure. I, uh, <laughs> It's been around for 33 years, and it's still really evident. It's doing very well. So, I've got another one from Eric, age 10, um, and this one this this ties into the pencil, but this this is not necessarily the pencil because I, I like how he's phrased this. He said, "When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Not when did you start to write. When did you know you wanted to be a writer?" It was later. It was. Uh, after the army, and I was in the army three years, eight months, 21 days, and nine hours. <laughs> Loved every minute of it, and uh, I'm joking. Uh, in a satellite tracking sta station, I, I was sitting one night, and I thought, I have to be a writer. And I'm not sure why that happened then. I'd, I'd come to read sometimes two books a day. I read all the time. I just read, I read, I tell young people to read like a wolf eats. It's just read. 
Read till you can't stand it. You know, just read till it's just all you are. And that's what I did. Uh, I then, we won't go into this, but I went to Hollywood for a year, studied with different people in Hollywood on how to write screenplays and, and magazine stuff. And, and then I started writing. Nickel a word, penny a letter. Books on, I did seven articles on Baron von Richthofen in the pilot, the First World War, under different names. Carson Dawes, Eldon Task, Paul Garrison. It's all me. And Westerns and mysteries. And now I love writing now more than I ever have, as a matter of fact. I really do. I just adore it. I, I, I love writing the way you fall in love. The hair on my neck goes up when, I, when a story works. It's like a wolf smelling blood or something. I just, it's just there, you know. It's really something. Kind of scary. <laughs> in a nice way. Got one here from Deborah. She says, what do you hope students notice and take away from your books? What do you wish teachers knew as they teach your books? Uh, I'm not qualified to. Uh, I'm actually not qualified to do anything. Uh, but I try to be as honest as I can in the books about about what happens to me or the person in the book or characters in the book or animals in the book. Um, there are things that are always going to be a mystery. Carl Sagan, I think, once said that the, the massive weight of ants on the planet is heavier than the massive weight of all the people combined. And I thought, God, that's just incredible to, to say that, to, to think that, to know that. And then I wondered, I wondered who who weighed the ants, and it, it becomes it becomes a point. It becomes a you know, come on, somebody had to weigh an ant and all the ants and get the ants together, and um, so there's always that wonder, and that's uh, really why I write. I think is for that wonder. It happens all the time. You were a different kind of writer. I'd suggest you use the term, the phrase. Who weighed the ants as a title because that's a very good title. I'm not, I don't know what it's a good title <laughs> of. But I think next book. Next book. Speaking of next books, I had where'd she go? See, this is from I'm going back and forth with these. All right, I this is from Don. I'm a fourth grade teacher, and I use your book Canoe to help my boys with writing. I love this book, and I'm wondering if you're planning to write another picture book. I was doing those with my wife and she's decided not to do them anymore. She uh, is painting uh, with straight oil paintings, just like still lifes and, and studies and stuff, uh, which she considers to be the art that she wants to work on. So probably I won't write any more picture books. The, 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 for a long time, I hid under a, co a kitchen table from my mother. Uh, I won't go into details, but I was being endangered. And the, under the kitchen table, it became a sanctuary, chrome legs. You could dodge around. And I was real little. And uh, I, I submitted a, a book to my agent once. It's called Under the Kitchen Table. <laughs> under the Kitchen Table, as if to be done as a picture book, but I, I don't think it'll ever, ha ever happen. <laughs> it's, it's a little, a little, a little risky. You know, sort of. Come on, it's a good idea for a book, but but it's probably not not a good book to read to little guys, to read the young people. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Honest though. Yeah, it was honest. <laughs> that, could be, that could be a chapter in this book. Really, really. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, I'll I'll do the old classic question here. Robin writes in, "What's your writing process?" I work all the time. Mm -hmm. I really do. Even if I'm not writing, I'm chewing on a story. Sometimes two of them. Uh, I don't have a schedule like that. I just sit down and work. And when I get tired, I quit. It's not healthy to do that, but I don't know what else to do. Someone writes, thank you for this book and all you've written. Perhaps cliche to ask, but what would you recommend to aspiring new authors? 
read. It's the only way to learn to write, I think, is to read. I know I, I used to lecture at universities and often the professors would ask me to help them get published. And that was very common, by the way. Um, it's all in books. We're the only species on the planet that saves our knowledge extra genetically, period. And the way we've chosen to save our knowledge is in those books. It's, it's not on the screen. It's not on television or films and stuff. Those it's just, that's entertainment. It doesn't work. But it's, it's, it's in books. It's in the Library of Congress. It's all there. Now, it's in the, on, you can get it on the line. You can learn things on, on the internet. Go to the Library of Congress on the internet. It's all there. Every bit of knowledge. And uh, you read it. You got to read it. And when you, when you read enough, sometimes you'll start to figure out how words work. Read Shakespeare. My God. I mean, seriously, seriously, how could he even do that? And, and uh, he just dances with language. I mean, read, read all the time. There's a lot of books, not just mine. I mean, a lot of books. I'm pointing to bookshelves in back of you. I'm sure nobody, not here, not here in the kitchen, there aren't any books, so. Yeah. Don't don't care for books myself, but no. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna end with this because this this last uh, this last thing that someone wrote in it's it's less of a less of a question, more of a comment, but I think it it sums this up really nice. This this comes from Jim. He writes, "Sir, are you aware of the impact that your writings have had on those who discovered you as adults?" Know that I am here tonight due to the lasting impact you have had on my life. I will be 77 on Sunday. Wow. Yeah. Say hi for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my God. <laughs> thank you. Well, Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's good to be here. This, this, this was great. This was just fantastic. It was. I agree. Thank Keep you. writing. Thank you to both of you for being here tonight. And thank you to everyone, all of the members of our audience who joined us. Um, just a, a quick...